Let me know when you're ready, Patrick. Used to holding a mic. I didn't even know what to do last week with Jim Rollins. I was waving my hands all around. <laughs> I finally put the top on the water bottle and <laughs> didn't know what to do. So you could do that too. We can just yeah. pretend. <laughs> oh. All right, wonderful. I've got to make sure that the top is actually on it. I put a milk carton back in our refrigerator without the top on it, and my husband was really pissed as milk started pouring down the shelves and out onto the floor. Oops. So, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. It's it's wonderful to see all of you. It's been such a long time. Happy New Year to you all, and Happy New Year to you. Thank you. Forward. It's great to be back out on the road. Last year was horrific. We couldn't travel anywhere. I know. And uh, was this last year... year the first year that we've missed? Yep. Last year, I think, is the first time in Brad's entire publishing career that he was not here. We yeah. did a virtual yeah, event COVID. with Mark. Didn't, didn't yeah. we do it with Mark? Yeah. But it's wonderful to see him anyway, his lovely wife here in the flesh. And we, page, but I'd rather not see well, I understand. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's 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 an author and publisher decision to a great extent, and then Sometimes it's us, but I think we've all realized that we're going to have to live with this, and right. if we're just careful. Um, and and we we thought about you know checking vaccination status and all, but it's just too hard for our staff. So if everybody wears a mask, we don't have to we don't have to do that. And even if you're vaccinated, you can you know you can shed. So it's just better this way. Well, this right. was the first time I had to sign a. Uh, I didn't actually have to sign it, but they gave me a disclaimer before going on tour. And it's, you know, we're not going to be responsible if a plane wrecks or you get in a car wreck or, oh, yeah, COVID. <laughs> so, basically saying, if you want to go do it, you're going to do it. So, in your distinguished career in the Army, did you ever sign a disclaimer? I, well, I've had, I've had more vaccinations than, I mean, I'm vaccinated for rabies. I'm vaccinated for everything. Me too. So. I've Japanese encephalitis and yellow fever because I've traveled all over. Yeah. So. I'm with you all from the Navy, so. Yeah, yeah so I've had. Anthrax, rabies, rabies everything. Yeah. Right. So. But I meant, did you ever sign a disclaimer when they sent you somewhere saying that you would hold us responsible no. for anything that went wrong? No, that was kind of part of the job description. <laughs> That's what I thought. It seems so unlikely. Yeah. Indeed. So, end of days, is this number 16? This is 16. Wow, that's just amazing. I mean, it wasn't even that long ago that Brad started, but many of you will recall that he published two books a year for some time until he finally yeah. called Mercy. Yeah, and it was crushing I, me. It, well, it was a lot. And, you know, yeah. your books are complicated, take a lot of research, and And it, you're not actually writing two books a year. You're promoting one book, editing a second book, and writing a third book, because they, they have to have all that stuff, you know. It's got to be rolling. I remember I finished, uh, I think it was No Fortunate Son. I mean, the day I hit the end and sent it off to the copy editor, my editor called me and said, uh, I need the title and the jack copy for the next book. I was like, I just finished. So. <laughs> no mercy there. Right. Well, one of the things I've always really liked about Brad's books is that he, he travels and he presents you with interesting landscapes. Um, We've been to all kinds of exotic places. Last year, he was really pissed because one of the reviewers said he hadn't done a particularly great job depicting oh, yeah. Taiwan. Taiwan, yeah. I know. Like, what um, are you talking about? I didn't write about a strip mall. <laughs> I mean, everything that's in there is some unique cultural Taiwanese thing. Right. So. I know. You were really offended. So this time, we get to start in Switzerland. Have any of you actually gone paragliding in the mountains or anywhere? Um, well, I know you have. <laughs> yes, but, well... I've, no. I've watched my children do it, I have to say. I haven't myself, actually. I saw my daughter rising over the sea off the west coast of Mexico at one point, <laughs> a long, long time ago, and I thought, oh, you know, what am I supposed to do here? But it's a great opening scene. So have you been there, and have you done Yeah, well, the problem with the... Uh, luckily, only 10% of my book research actually ends up in a book. I know. And so I, uh, I couldn't travel anywhere last year. That was COVID... Two things bad about COVID was number one, I had nowhere to write. Uh, I don't have a writing desk. I don't have a writing office in my house. I pack up my trusty bag with a laptop in it and I'll go to a park or I'll go to a library or I'll go wherever I'm gonna go. 
but everything closed down. And so I'm stuck on the couch with my wife saying, get off the couch, <laughs> go somewhere else. Um, and so I couldn't do any on the ground research. I couldn't travel anywhere. Yeah. And so I started going back, I, you know, like the grottos in um, uh, Israel. I'd been there, but I never used them in a book. A um, bunch of stuff in Tel Aviv I hadn't used in a book. Switzerland, all over, I hadn't used in a book. Elaine is the one that did the paragliding. Uh, ah. And I, luckily she came home with all these videos so I could look at the three ring release assemblies and all these other things that these guys are wearing as they're doing it so I could figure out, okay, how am I going to kill that guy? What's it going to cut? <laughs> well, of course, that's why you watch a whole video, right? Is so you can figure out how to kill somebody. Well, the other problem I had with, with COVID was, uh, you know, do you put it in the book? I mean, some people, uh, like Mark Greeny, we were talking about it, and he's like, I'm just, no, I'm not even writing about it. I'm ignoring it. Just pretend like it's not there. And uh, I was like, well, I can't really ignore it. I mean, when I, I did American Trader, I kind of fudged on that one. So I, I went to Taiwan and Australia, did all the research for American Trader, and then uh, then we got locked down. And I'm like, how's this going to work? You know, how's Pike going to be doing surveillance in the Sydney Opera House when there's only two people on the street, him in the dark, everybody else is locked down? Um, so I just pushed it to January 2020, uh, right when the elections were going on in Taiwan, which is what the book was about anyway. But this time I had to make a decision. Right. You know, we're still, I looked at it, I was starting, you know, and it was in June, and I was thinking, I did all the data research and said, well, if this thing's completely gone in January, nobody wants to read about COVID after the fact. They're all out boozing it up. Uh, but I looked at the data and said, uh, I don't think this thing's going away. Um, and so I entered it into the book itself. You did. Uh, well, explain to us, well, tell us about Switzerland, because that's the opening chapter, so it's not really a significant spoiler. And then I like the way that you brought um, the pipe in, yeah. um, into, the, into the story. So that's I, where you did your COVID test. Yeah, that's where I, I had a, back at the, you know, the U.S. couldn't fly anywhere. You couldn't get into the EU. You, all these countries are saying, don't go in. Certain countries would let you in, but then you couldn't come back out. Uh, we, we made it to Croatia this year for the book research for book 17. Um, but now they're all getting locked down again. And so I said, well, Pike can't fly anywhere. The only way you can fly anywhere is if you're doing uh, official government business for the United States. Well, by definition, a task force is not official government. It's a clandestine organization. So they couldn't say I'm with the government. They had to just say I'm grow your recovery services, in which case they'd say you're not coming over. Um, but the Israelis had an enormous vaccine uh, push. I mean, yeah. they vaccinated everybody. And um, because of that, Israel was allowed to come in. And because of that, I was like, well, if Israel can get in there, I've got Aaron and Shoshana. They'll get with Pike and give him an Israeli passport. Now they can all go tearing off to Switzerland. And that's what I did. <laughs> I, I know. They were marooned. Poor things in Charleston, South Carolina. What a terrible <laughs> place to be locked in. You should know that since that's where you're Yeah, we were locked down for quite a while. It's a beautiful city. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. city, but uh, they'd been there for a while. They probably were ready to yeah. go, huh? Yeah, we, we've actually been open for about a, a year, maybe longer. I mean, they had a mask mandate and things like that. Um, but you could go to restaurants and eat outside. It's, you know, it's come and gone back and forth. How are you going to do it? Ashley Hall's, a, a, they'd actually do weddings there. Uh, it's my daughter's school. In the summertime, they do weddings there. But they had a strict level of how many people you could bring because of COVID. And so when I saw all that, I was like, well, I can use all that. That's easy. Easy research. <laughs> Just put that, whatever the level is, I can put in there and be done with it. So who are the people, what, who's the target in Switzerland? Because that matters as to how this all goes forward. Yeah, he's a, what's called a Ramsad is the uh, um, head of the Mossad, basically. He's the, the guy that runs the Mossad. And this guy's a retired guy. And he's actually in some of the short stories. Infiltrator, he's been there for a while. Uh, but he's now retired. He's living the high life in Switzerland. And um, he gets assassinated, basically. And they pin it on Kitab Hezbollah. Uh, Kitab Hezbollah is a, it's not to be confused with Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. They're a uh, PMU uh, uh, organization, a militia inside Iraq. Um, and they whacked us, they killed us like no tomorrow when we were in Iraq with explosively foreign penetrators provided by Iran. Um, and so we would take it to them. Well, then ISIS popped up, and now we're kind of working together. Enemy, my enemy is my friend. You're going to kill ISIS, I'm going to kill ISIS. We won't talk to each other, but you guys go ahead and we'll interface with the Iraqis. Well, then they, they were put into the, um, the actual military structure of the Iraqi system. Mm -hmm. Even though they don't in the military, they're getting paid and all this stuff, and they're all Shia. Um, 
which uh, there's no Sunni PMUs, they're all Shia PMUs, and these guys have started expanding. They're going all over. Um, they fall apart. They're all over Syria. They're they're just moving out in the world. If you see any time that somebody is, um, we'll do an airstrike in Syria, like we just did one the other day. It's against Qatar Hezbollah almost every time. They're the ones that shot Thank you. the um, uh, rockets into our our compound and killed four contractors that precipitated us killing Soleimani, the general. Uh, one thing people don't, didn't pay any attention to, well, there were two people in that car. The head of Qatab Hezbollah was also killed. Uh, of course, Soleimani's the one that made the news. And at first, I actually had a conspiracy theory about this. You did. Uh, that I don't believe it now, but for about four days, I was like, I think we were killing the head of Qatab Hezbollah because that's the guy that's targeting our people. And then we went, who else was in that car? <laughs> what? We killed Soleimani? No, no, we meant to do that. Um, but after reading enough about it, we did definitely mean to do it. Um, but the head of Qatab Hezbollah was in that vehicle, and they sworn vengeance against us because we killed their head guy. And they're all over the place. So these the bad guys are leveraging Qatab Hezbollah. Qatab Hezbollah thinks they're working for Iran, but they're really just they're getting worked over by some other guys. Okay. Well, I have to say, when I opened the book and started reading it, I, you could figure out what was going on. I really didn't want the guy to die. I thought, there must be some way we can save him. But, but no, the whole story would have just died right there. You know, he would have been saved, and that would have been the end of the book, four or five pages the side, in, the right? Side guy? Yeah, yeah, I really liked him. I mean, you know, you only sketch him out, but I thought, yeah. what a waste. Then I thought about Daniel Silva, where is he? Only it's not, a... it's not Mossad that um, that Gabriel, it's, um, I'm trying to remember, Shin, what is he, they call it? I thought he was Mossad. Is he? I think so. He's not Shin Bet. Shin Bet's a, a, more of a police force. And he's out. Well, he's Israeli intelligence, but right. I'm not sure. Is that Mossad? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there we are. All right. Um, anyway, there there's a series of um, events that happen, and I kept thinking that surely his security team would figure it out right. before it happens. I right. mean, there were some fairly heavy clues that... Yeah. Something yeah. weird was happening, right? But, yeah, but he's, uh, uh, I mean, his the security team's going to defer to him. Right. And he was like, I'm going. You just leave me alone. And uh, they, they, the whole way, the reason he gets killed that way is because they had to separate him from his security. They had to look at, okay, how can we get him away from his security? Uh, because we can't attack him with a security there. They'll slaughter us all. And they found out he liked to do his paragliding stuff and said, well, there's no security people with him when he's doing the paragliding stuff. And that's what they're, they're that would actually be kind of a nice image, right? Two of them going off at the same time, one of them with a gun, one of them floating in the air, and <laughs> didn't work out that way. All right, so when it happens, that's what triggers off Israel, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so the Mossad thinks it's Qatab Hezbollah. They think Iran's behind it. There's Sabres are starting to rattle. The United States, there's some diplomats in the United States who are also killed, um, and it's Qatab Hezbollah. And so the majority of the people in the government are saying it's Iran, but take it to Iran. They're the ones supporting it. Um, and there's a subset of the Mossad that doesn't think it's there's something funny about this. We're not really sure this is Qatab Hezbollah. We're not really sure it is Iran. Do we really want to go to war with Iran because, you know, everybody's up in arms and rattling sabers? So that's why they hire uh, Aaron and Shoshana. They're both now contractors, and they've sort of plausible deniability. You mm -hmm. guys go figure this out. Right, and so they go to Charleston with Israeli passports and recruit you. All right, and so other bad things happen. Yeah, there's a, uh, well, about, uh, it was Ring of Fire. Well, we came out of Morocco doing book research for Ring of Fire, um, and uh, my wife planned a two-day layover in Rome. Didn't tell me about it. So instead of flying home, we did the, uh, Segway tours and things like that. And we were on a Segway tour being the great American tourist, and this vehicle went by uh, with diplomatic plates. And our tour guide said, uh, oh, that guy's a Knight of Malta. That's a Knight of Malta, which I'd never heard of. I said, what's a Knight of Malta? So he took us to the Magisterial Palace and um, gave me a quick class on it, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. So the Knights of Malta have been around since the First Crusade. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, everybody's heard of the Knights Templar. Well, Knights Templar got burned at the stake by the Catholic Church, and Knights of Malta learned early on it's better to be number two because they ended up with all the Knights Templar's land and possessions and everything. Uh, they started out as a hospital. They then moved, turned into an army like the Knights Templar. They then turned into a navy 
when they were in Malta. In fact, they're credited with uh, stopping the Ottoman Empire from invading Europe. Um, and they have, uh, they have their own passports. They have diplomatic relations with a plethora of countries. They have uh, their own currency. They have their own postage. Uh, they have a seat at the UN. And they're, by international law, considered, considered a sovereign entity. Um, but they don't have any terrain. They've got this magisterial palace that they're renting from Rome. It's sort of like the Vatican, but without the Vatican. Right. Yeah. They, 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 and they, uh, they have fights with the Vatican. They obviously work for their, their lay organization for the Catholic Church. Uh, but they, they, they butt heads all the time. And there's just an enormous amount of conspiracy theories around them. And so I started doing a lot of research about those guys. And the more research I did, the more I was like, do I really want to make this whole group, you know, bad guys? Because they're not really bad people. They actually do good work around the world right now. They've gone back to their hospital roots, and that's all they do. Um, but uh, as the more research I did, I was like, you know, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this kind of a Iran Contra type thing. So you've got Oliver North and his band of merry men, but that doesn't mean the entire United States government's corrupt. It means there's a segment in there that's doing bad stuff. And that's what I decided to do with Garrett and his guys. Knights of Malta, if I remember right, survived one of the most vicious sieges ever mm -hmm. on, on Malta. Malta. Yeah, Malta. They were besieged by Suleiman, I think it was. And, um, and, and that's there's some incredible the... novels about, about how they made it through the siege. And then they got kicked out by Bonaparte, Napoleon. He just landed there and said, everybody get out of here. And so he took over Malta and they ended up in Rome. And then the British took Malta, right. But anyway, no, they were an amazing um, yeah, they just kept getting kicked out of places. They, their full name is really long, so it's from Jerusalem to here to here to here. Knights Hospitaller, I think, yeah, is part of the yeah, whole deal. Yeah. Right. And it ended up, uh, their last place was Malta. And so they're kind of known as Knights of Malta. They have a segment here in the United States. They're all over the world. Uh, so I had to, I mean, I did research on where do they have diplomatic relations with. And they, they don't have it with Israel, believe it or not. Even though they start out in Jerusalem, they don't have one with Israel. They do in Lebanon. They do in Jordan. They do in, actually in, in the West Bank and the Palestinian Occupied territories, they have a place. Um, so they're all over the world, really. But I was surprised to see that Israel didn't have a hmm. uh, relations with them. They're a really interesting group. So um, there's not a lot we can say about where this book goes without completely spoiling it. Um, <laughs> how, so you did your research at the Knights of Malta while you were in Rome, and then you came home and... Well, no, actually, no. I, I tucked them in the back of my mind, because um, that was like five books ago. I said, sooner or later, I'm oh. going to put them in a book. Okay. I just thought it was fascinating. In fact, we were in Switzerland doing research for um, Daughter of War, and one of the tour guides was with us. Was that her husband was an ambassador. She was a diplomat her whole life, and now she's retired and does tours. And I said, hey, what do you think about the Knights of Malta? And she showed me her Maltese cross ring and said, we don't talk about that in mixed company. And I was like, this is even more fascinating. <laughs> You've got to know about this group. So there was in the back of my head this whole time, and then when I got locked in for COVID, I said, okay, now as you, you know, Amazon does exist. I bought probably eight books on the Knights of Malta uh, and just started doing in-depth research from that point to use them in the book. That's wonderful how you can mine your own life, right, for interesting <laughs> stuff. So, anything else you'd like to say about the book? Um, yeah, I actually enjoyed uh, it. It, was, it got really hard to write. Um, I always end up painting myself into a corner. And I'm like, how am I going to solve this problem? What am I going to do about this? And uh, that happened a lot in the book. <laughs> there was a lot of times when I, uh, for instance, just as a scene, Bretton and Knuckles uh, do a free fall jump into Syria to uh, take on the real Hezbollah. And uh, once I got him on the ground, I'm like, how am I going to get him out of there? I mean, I can't land a plane there. And what am I going to do about there, the... This guy is trying to escape into Lebanon. I was at the grottoes there, and there's an old train tracks that go in, underneath the grottoes. It used to be uh, back before the state of Israel was even created. So they had these trains that went from Lebanon down into uh, what became the country of Israel. And I was like, that's what he's going to use. He's going to escape through that. Well, of course, that's an idiotic solution, because why would Israel leave that open to Lebanon? It's now completely sealed up. And uh, when I figured, I already had the whole thing in my head and was writing it, and I was like, well, he can't get out. <laughs> now what am I going to do? <laughs> I've had this whole chase scene all the way up to the grottos. And I said, well, I'll just, you know, you've had the idea that he could do it. I'll just make him think he has the idea he could do it. And now he's going to find it's all blocked off. He's going to have to try to do something else. It's fiction. Yeah. You could actually just let him go, right? Well, right above that is a, is a UN checkpoint, and I've been to that checkpoint, 
um, which the only people who can cross over it are uh, UN personnel and you know there's guards and all that. Yeah, it's right there. You know the Green Line runs all the way up there to from way back when when uh, Israel invaded you know um, Lebanon during the fight in Hezbollah. But you raise an interesting question. I mean, if you're writing fiction, how closely do you have to hew to reality, or could you, in fact, just blast your way into Lebanon? I had I hew pretty closely, but I don't always. I mean, if I need something, I'll make it. Uh, in this case, I thought that's a kind of a big make because Israel, there's no way they would leave that open for uh, infiltrators from Hezbollah just to come flooding into Israel. They just, just wouldn't let that happen. But there's been certain times, plenty of times when uh, um, I'm trying to think. Well, for instance, in One Rough Man, there's, a, there's an Irish pub that's real. You can go, most, everything that's in my books, you can go to. That pub, the Irish pub, speaking of an Irish pub, uh, that they go to meet the uh, Mossad guys, it's right outside Mossad headquarters. Mm -hmm. And it's a real Irish pub, and it's there. Um, an Irish pub in Jerusalem? Yeah. It's, it's actually Tel Aviv, but yeah. And it's, uh, if you look at this, it's kind of cool because you go to Google Earth or to um, Satellite View or whatever, and you don't see anything uh, on the map. There's just a bunch of green space. There's nothing there. Well, if you go to satellite, then you see the buildings, and it's Mossad. But they, they obviously told Google, don't put us on your map. And so it's just this road goes in, and there's nothing there. Well, it's actually Mossad headquarters. Um, but I, I, was, I put an Irish pub in uh, One Rough Man, and Pike's got to run out of the pub. There's going to be a big shootout. That's real. It's in this strip mall, and I needed some spot for Pike to get into uh so he needed an alley well there isn't an alley but there is my book <laughs> i mean i just said okay i'm gonna make an alley right there with parking behind it uh so sometimes i'll do that um, but most of the times it's easier for me that's why i like getting on the ground if i go um, and see a place like this building right here i could write an assault scene for this place because i've seen it all and i know it. you should see the pictures i have that are they're ridiculous i mean i'll have a picture of that sign first edition sign and then there'll be I'll have all the ceiling fans, and I'll have everything on the ground, and I'll take a picture. I mean, everything, so I'll know when I reconstruct that thing how to do it. And see, I can always make use of that stuff, like where he went into, right. things like that. Um, so it's easier for me to take a look at something just like I would in the military and then design the assault around it. Wow, well, tactical training pays off when you're writing a military fiction. But it is good. I, to, it. I mean, if you're doing fiction, you're you're right. So if I had to do this whole thing, and then there's, there's a breach point right here, and I don't want to use that breach point because they're all coming from this one, well, that door will cease to exist. <laughs> right. No, I mean, I, I, yeah, that, as I said, that's why it's called fiction. So another question. Do you, do you try always to go different places, or do you think it's yeah. okay to repeat? Uh, so far, I've gone to different places, but I am running out. My wife was laughing and saying, I guess we're going to have to set the next one in Antarctica. We, and everywhere well, you else. you could do that. Actually, Antarctica is becoming, you know, more and more traveled. But this, like, or just Greenland. Um, you could go to the opposite because there is a yeah. lot of traffic. You know, I did the Northwest Passage crew in 2017, and now they're taking cruises around Greenland. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, okay. Well, we haven't done India either. I don't know if Elaine wants to go to India, though. Have you done much in Canada? No, I haven't done anything in Canada. Um, Canada, why else is? Yeah. Yeah, the I Arctic, the, the Canadian Arctic, especially Northwest Canada, is, is really, there's a great book here called Ice Angel by Matthew Hart, which is a fabulous thriller set up in that area. And it's also one of the great diamond fields in the world. We don't often think of Canada as being, but it's actually as good as South Africa or maybe better. So, you know, there you are, another thought. So I, uh, on this one, I just, you know, went to every, where I'd been before because we didn't get to travel. We went to Croatia, and the only reason, I mean, I had the whole trip planned out for Croatia for this right. end of days, and I couldn't go. So then with time to do book research, I was like, we haven't been to Croatia, I'm going. So I'm not going to be the bad guys Croatian because I had a great time there. The bad guys I love are Croatia. Croatia. Just it's one of the best trips we ever took on this funny little Croatian. In, in their idea of a luxury cabin in the bathroom, there was a rod, and the shower curtain went around the toilet, and if you want to take a shower, you had to stand on the toilet, yeah. and then the, the water would come in. Um, it was, but it was great, because it was so little. It went to, like, a bar and, you yeah, know, we went to, that's interesting we, uh, ports. We started up in the capital in the north and rented a car and hit every little town all the way down to Dubrovnik. And there are fabulous ruins. Diocletian's Palace is one of the coolest of all Roman ruins. I mean, Game of ruins. Thrones. Yep, it really there was. Had Game of Thrones tours, so um, I put that in somehow. We went to all those and saw, you know, 
Yeah, and a big <laughs> yeah, thing about it's a Cove. small country, but around, and also it was a huge vineyard area too. Um, which one is Vespasian? Actually, had land there and grew, grew wine and just wonderful stuff. Well, that's what folks need is as you go down the coastline. It's you know the, the north is uh, Italy, the bottom, the middle of the Dalmatian coast is more Greek, and it just changes as it goes down. And we you know we took ferries everywhere. You know how many how many vehicles the Croatians can get on a ferry? One more. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, they cramp them all in there. We went in there and we were going in sideways. I'm like, does he realize we're out of room? I love but, it. Most people think it's just Dubrovnik, but um, there's a lot more too. Yeah, and then right so below it is Montenegro. And I think it's Qatar. Is, is, what is the name of the? There's a little port there that's the capital of Montenegro. I think it's Kotor. Uh, it's K O T O R, I think. Anyway, it's a gorgeous place. You'd never travel again. I seriously recommend going down the coast of Croatia. Yeah, there's, I learned a lot. Um, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Bosnia, uh, but I didn't realize that Croatia had their butt handed to them during the war as well. Yeah. I mean, they had a lot of fighting going on. They, 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 they really take that seriously. They don't like Serbs, I'll tell you well, that. Well, Yugoslavia, you know, Tito put together and held together Yugoslavia, yeah. and then it all fell apart again when he died. But, um, yeah. It yeah, was... I didn't know that you had so much fighting that went on uh, inside Croatia itself. I, just, I thought it was all in Bosnia. Um, but they had a lot of damage done. All the way up and down the coast. And they had the same tribal and same ethnic religious divisions, too. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a funny part of the world. It's also small, too. Have any of you been to Israel or been to Jordan? Israel? Yeah. I mean, you know, I can remember standing on the on the edge of the Dead Sea on the Jordan side looking over Jerusalem. I, I mean, it's just across the lake, you know, and I thought, seriously? <laughs> Well, there used to be. It That's used to be. Question. Yeah, it was. It was very. They're fertile. always on fire. No, no, no. It was. It I'll was, be here all night. It was fertile back when when all of that was going on. But it's just that we're so used to you know space that it's it's amazing to recognize how tiny the yeah. area. I mean, you can walk it. You know. Yeah. When I did the research in uh, Israel, I did do. I mean, Haifa's all the way to the north. Right. And uh, I just did a huge loop. It didn't take much time at all. No, I mean, you can put the whole of British Isle in Arizona. You can easily yeah. put Israel in Arizona with plenty of room to spare. It's like about Central Park. Is it about like Central Park? Central Park. Wow, that is a scary. <laughs> oh, yeah. About Israel? Yeah. Everybody's got a gun. I felt very special. Well, I got lost. I was in Tel Aviv, and it was late. Um, I was trying to find the embassy. It's impossible to find. They don't have an address listed. And it was probably midnight, and I couldn't remember where I was. I was on a hotel on the coast. And so I knew if I could just hit the coast, I could find my hotel. You know, <laughs> Joppa's down here. This is up here. As long as I walk until I have water, I'm going to find my You're hotel. You're okay. And so I'm going through this back alley, and there's two girls walking, in, and it's, I mean, it's dark alley. And I thought, uh, oh, man, they're going to think I'm you know, doing something skeevy over here. They walked by me and didn't even glance at me. And I thought, if they had absolutely no fear of me in that dark alley, there's there's not any crime in this city. You jolly Mr. Rogers sort of face, come on. Yeah. I said, you know, you, you don't want to make them feel bad. And they walked by and didn't say a word to me. I eventually found my hotel too, so that worked out. Oh, was that depressing not to be a threat? No, I mean, that's, that made me feel good. I was like, I mean, that's kind of the cultural stuff you get just by getting on the ground. I mean, people would say all day long that it's a super safe city. Well, they're trying to get you to go there. It's not until you get on the ground and say, is it really super safe? So there's a whole kind of community of guys writing military thrillers, you know, many of whom appear here, as you know. Uh, in fact, next Monday, we're going to debut Stephen Hunter's new book, which is amazing, um, with Jack Carr. And um, you're going to visit Mark in mm -hmm. Tucson, but Mark will be here on February. We haven't broken this to his publicist yet, but he's actually coming live on Saturday. February 12th, and then we have Don Bentley, and we have Mark Cameron, and, you know. Don Bentley will be at my house January 21st for Elaine's big book launch party. Oh, nice. He was here. We had dinner in December. He was here with Jeffrey Deaver, actually, mm -hmm. by chance. Yeah, I saw the post. Right. But, you know, so do all of you, you know, do you parcel out the world so that you're not all writing about, like, one country at the same time or one no. group? No, I haven't mm -hmm. talked to Fact, There's no conspiracy going on. I haven't talked to anybody about my books ever. 
Yeah, I mean, I, Mark Green is a good friend of mine, but we don't. I don't talk. I mean, I talk weapons with him. I'll talk other things, but right. I, I never say, "Hey, here's what I'm writing about. What do you think of that?" Well, do they say it to you? No. 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 So it'd be a real coincidence that suddenly everybody puts out a book that's set in the Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> it would. But uh, no, I don't tell. I mean, I, I got my lane. I know what I'm writing. I mean. Did any of you watch the Dirk Cussler video when he was here for for cruelty? You might not have. Well, as you know, you know, Dirk sits like all over the world, right? All kinds of exotic locations and all that. So this book, it's Tibet and the Philippines. And so I sat down with Dirk and we started out and I said, so Dirk, I said, Dirk Pitt, you know, naval guy, why is he in Tibet? And he looked me right in the eye and he said, it's the one place I knew you'd never been. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, didn't want to run through the critique or whatever it all was, but I thought, okay, that was for me. But I mean, seriously, at some point, I think yeah, some, might. I just, more, I... more than one of you is going to come up in the same year with some, you know, similar landscape. Yeah, but I'm, I mean, I guess when you have an arm wrestling contest to see who's going to back off. Because if I said, hey, I'm writing a book about the Philippines, and Mark Green said, so am I, I'm gonna, I'd say, well, you better quit. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I know what I'm writing about. <laughs> that would be a different Philippine. His version of it and your version right. of it would probably be, you know, dramatically yeah. different. Yeah. How many of you read other authors besides Brad in this genre? I, I, okay. I'm a big Green fan. And, um, and that I just want to ask you about a quick question about Mark. He's hilarious to watch him. Yeah. Just the quips he makes. I'm like, I'm like, dude, if you ever want to stop writing, you can be the first comedian. Yeah, he is funny. He's really he's funny. Very funny. <laughs> and he's in a happy place, which makes him even yeah. funnier, too. Yeah. Yeah. There were times when he wasn't quite so funny, right. but now he's Definitely. happy, and so he is funny. Yeah, he's a great guy. I'm spending a night at his house tomorrow night. Oh, that's right. You're going to Memphis, right? In his fancy new house with his gorgeous new office. And, right. and what do you call, I'm trying to remember, his security is now how many dogs? I think he has two. No, no, no. It's more than that. Four? <laughs> no, at least. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So. Like lifestyle dogs? Like, uh... And no. They're rescue dogs. They're basically rescue yeah. dogs. And he's yeah. making fun. He's, he's on he's on Instagram a lot, and I do the bookstore and Instagram. It's my only tech accomplishment. Is I've somehow managed to figure out Instagram. I'm totally defeated by Facebook and Twitter, and don't even want to learn. But um, so Mark is frequently on Instagram, which is how I keep up with him. And he had a funny post about four of the dogs, and. They were asleep or doing something, and he mentioned that his security service, security patrol or something could be better, which I thought was, you know, was really fun. Right. Um, it's too bad that Kyle Mills is now in Spain so often because we don't get to see him, but maybe he'll come back. He's got Does some. He yeah, he, he, he spends time in Granada, in, oh. which is a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, we try to bring as many of them here to see you book. as we can. Right, so anybody else have questions they'd like to ask? I actually have a question. Uh, in the last American Trader, who's the guy that knows, who you know, that loves bourbon? Because you know, like, I actually investigated the bourbon that you put in that last yeah. scene. Yeah, he's, uh, um, he's my old boss. Okay. And now he's CEO of a bourbon company, Barstown Bourbon. I'm not a rum guy, and I'm like, I'm like I'm a yeah. bourbon and scotch guy, and I'm like, I'm going to go check this out. I know this is real. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, um, Mark Irwin. <laughs> is this the pappy guy? <laughs> no, he's, he used to be my old boss, and now he's CEO of a bourbon company. And so, like, no, but it was the what's the fancy bourbon called? Pappy something, is no, it? No, Bardstown. Bardstown bourbon is what it's called. Yeah. Okay. And I don't drink bourbon, so I'm totally lost here. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So I'm an English teacher, junior high. Got some advice for my students. They're starting out. Not very good. They're not very good writers yet. You know, they're working on it. You obviously weren't as good as you are now when you began. Can you talk to us about the process of going from a beginning writer to uh, where you are today? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've never had any instruction on how to be a writer. I mean, I didn't take any classes on writing and haven't done anything with writing. I don't have an MFA. I don't do any of that. And what I set out to do my first book was to write a book that I wanted to read. I didn't think it was going to sell. I mean, I was teaching at Citadel. I was on a break between going back to Fort Bragg, and uh, I thought it'd sit on the bedside table. My mom would say, that's a really good book, Brad, and that'd be the end of that. And um, it sold. 
Uh, and there was a lot of work to go in. I mean, when I first wrote uh, One Rough Man, that was all in third person. And I went back and rewrote it all, and every time he's on the page, it's first person, and then it goes back to third person for the antagonist. I first started writing out, I, I like history a whole lot, so I had just an enormous amount of history that my editor said, get rid of all that. It's just killing the book. So, like, there's a scene on the Isle of Palms, uh, which is near Charleston, and it's where the Hunley launched out and uh, blew up the ship and then sank and all that. I go into huge detail about all that, and my editor's like, you know, we're racing along, and then we're taking a detour to the Civil War and coming back. And I had that kind of stuff throughout the whole book. Uh, anytime there's something going on, I was writing about Bosnia, and then there's you know, the scenes about Bosnia and what happened in Bosnia, a big history lesson. So the main thing I had to learn was how to tighten that stuff up uh, and keep the pace and the flow going as it goes forward. Uh, but I have gotten better, there's no doubt. I mean, I, my first editorial letter was five pages long. Here's all the pathetic stuff in your book you're going to fix. Um, now I get, for in the days, I got a couple comments in the margin. Never even, I didn't get a letter. Um, I think uh, last time I got a letter was one paragraph, and I think it was uh, insider threat. And after that, it's just they just go straight to the Word document and say, fix this, fix that. Um, I mean, practice makes perfect, I guess, is the main thing I'd say. Just the more you write, the better you're going to get at it. Why did they buy your first book if, in fact, you took a five-page editorial letter to get it anywhere? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I wasn't the editor, so now I'm really curious. So they he, must have seen raw talent that they could shape. Yeah, I guess. I mean, when he, when um, uh, Dutton purchased it, I got asked three questions. Number one, was I uh, uh, really in special forces? Right. Number two, did you really write the book? Because a lot of people, I guess, don't write their own books. Uh, number three, um, can you send me a picture of yourself, just in case I didn't look like Jabba the Hutt? And um, Number four, do you think you can write another one? And at that point, I knew they were serious. So I said, you know, here's my picture. Here's everything you need to know. And yeah, I think I can write another one. Actually, ghostwriting is a major authorial profession. It really is. And since they sign NDAs, you don't necessarily. I had a really interesting conversation Monday with uh, Michael Robotham, who's a two-time gold dagger and multi-award winner, fabulous British writer. And he got his start. He wrote 12 celebrity autobiographies. You love it. Autobiographies that sold millions of copies. And he was never allowed to talk about anyone. But finally, Jerry Halliwell, one of the Spice Girls, agreed that he could <laughs> own up to the fact, or she could own up to the fact that um, Michael had written her autobiography. Um, and, you know, it's, he said he really learned to write in dealing with all that. Um, you know, it would be, he was a newspaper guy anyway, but then writing, writing, because every time you wrote, you had to be in somebody else's voice and somebody else's right. life. You know, you couldn't write yourself <clears throat> in doing that. And so it made it easier, yeah, you know, when, when he finally. Um, Especially if you're writing as a male to the Spice Girls. I, mean. <laughs> I thought it was, yeah, I mean, Jerry Halliwell, I thought, you know, he could have been, I thought that was really interesting <laughs> that she picked him. I didn't even know that they were, he said. Because I've just been watching this Beatles thing. I'm sort of mesmerized by eight and a half hours of um, of the Beatles, the Peter Jackson thing. But, um, you know, and they are the best-selling band in the world, and and I think still are, actually. But the Spice Girls apparently were as big or bigger um, at the end of really? the 90s. Yeah, yeah. According to, according to him. I mean, <laughs> it's an age thing. Any of you, the Spice Girls, is the music in your head? Do you all really see? I, I mean, no. I know. I don't either. Whereas I can, I can hear, you know. Oh yeah, that's yeah. a true story. Well, we, I was on the ground doing research, and they hit. Uh, um, there's a, a statue of uh, Freddie Mercury, a big life-size statue, and then they had the. It's, uh, in, Lausanne, it's in Lausanne, Switzerland. No, not Lausanne. It's, uh, Montreux. Um, Montreux, Switzerland, on the waterfront. I know, I terrified my husband. I came back from a walk. Was it fun? He said, yeah. I said, I saw Freddie Mercury. I thought Rob was yeah. going to pick me up and rush me to the nearest psychiatric hospital. And it was there because they have a big jazz festival in Montreux, and Freddie Mercury was involved in that. So they and they also, he, he had, a, um, I guess, a, English taxes were way too, a lot of people recorded at that right. studio. Uh, and in fact, I talk about the book, the, the songs uh, Smoke on the Water is about his studio burning the ground. Um, 
smoke on the water, fire in the sky, because they're all smoking dope and it's burning to the ground. But David Bowie, Under Pressure, was written there, sung there. Yeah. Which was a huge fight because Freddie Mercury's playing on it, David Bowie's, they have two different record labels and they couldn't couldn't get together on who's going to release it. So, I, and we just stumbled on that. I didn't know anything about it. That's, That's a great statue, it though, isn't it? It's yeah. a great place. All right. Did any of you watch the 2012 Olympics? Do you remember the finale in London, the last day of the Olympics? They brought out all the great British bands, which is the only time I've ever seen the Spice Girls or even heard of them. <laughs> and that's also what I learned about Freddie Mercury. <laughs> it was I mean, seriously, it was a really yeah. great thing, and you recognize how terrific the the British had been in the music business in the second half of the twentieth mm -hmm. century. Really significant stuff. And they all fled to Montreux because the British were charging them too much. <laughs> Whatever. Anybody else have a more book related question? Yeah. Most of your like manuscripts and stuff like that, you didn't give it to somebody to kind of go over it and make uh, my my wife's my first reader. Yeah, yeah. and usually it's for uh, if I'm writing a scene about something and it's got military stuff in it, and she can read it and she if she says I don't know what the hell's going on here, then I need to rewrite it because it'll make perfect sense to me. Um, and then she does a lot of grammar stuff too. Did she, she have the GDC part of it with Jennifer? No, she's she's a grammar Nazi. She'll say you can't say this, you can't say that. But a friend of mine got into writing, and he let me kind of go through some of his stuff. Of course, I I'm not the greatest writer in the world. Mm -hmm. I know certain things, and I would just kind of. Put a big X through it and yeah. make a little comment. And then he always got back to me and said, Oh, God, thanks a lot for that. He said, I would have made a real fool of myself. Or something like well, that. I actually have to do that for quite a bit of stuff. Um, like, uh, you know, the Brett's a Force Recon Marine, um, Knuckles is a SEAL, and Pike's uh, um, Scuba. But I'm not. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm Patty certified, but I haven't been to combat dive school. Uh, which rebreathers and all that require a lot of different stuff. It's not just, mm -hmm. you know, jumping in the water. And so I'll contact a buddy of mine that uh, has, has been to combat dive school and say, can you read all this? I had, to, I knew the, um, well, senior jump master for free fall operations, tandem and all that, uh, was a good friend of mine. So I'm writing a tandem scene and, you know, I'm free fall, but I'm not tandem. So I got to make sure I did that right. So I did everything right except the very end. I still had him do something. I said, I'm putting that in there because it sounds cool. You can yell at me later. But I sent it to him, and he immediately writes back. It's, it's all screwed up. None of this is what we would do. And so he goes through the whole thing with me and fixes it. So I do have to do that for quite a few times. Well, it's, uh, it's amazing the amount of research. I never realized writers had to do so much research until I started doing a lot of reading. And well, it's even little it things like on what you're writing. you can't. You know, I'm writing a scene with an AK-47, and I'm like, I can't remember. Does this thing lock open at the last round, or does it go forward? Turns out it does both. Depends on the weapon. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, you're writing in a you're writing a kind of book where the weaponry absolutely has to be right. You could you could you know maybe let yeah. people go up the the train through the cliffs or something and get away with it, but if you screw up a gun, you're going to be yeah. in serious trouble. Uh, I did. Trust me. You can screw up anything and you're going to be in serious trouble. I get more emails and I just want you to know that this is, and usually it's something about research. In fact, I just got one. What was it? And they'll say something about, uh, uh, you know, I don't got, you don't know anything about this and this is all wrong and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I actually walked that terrain. I've got pictures of it. They think I just, you know, made it up or something. Uh, but if you, if you, if I mess a weapon system up, I'm definitely going to hear about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that people who read military fiction rely on weaponry being absolutely accurate. I mean, I love reading Stephen Hunter. My eyes glaze over quite often <laughs> when I'm reading about the guns, you know. But the fact that it's the sniper part, I mean, regardless of what the weapon is, it's, you know, what the sniper can do that really, that really matters. Right. So it's very cool. Also, I will tell you the targeted on Monday is just an incredibly politically incorrect book. Just the kind of thing you want to read at the moment. I love reading it. Yep. A couple of uh, questions and comments. Oh, good. Okay. One Fire away. From, uh, from Jordan, who says that uh, he wants to know how big of a fan of Star Wars you are. He likes the references to, to the 
I, I, I'm a fan of Star Wars, but I don't. I have more references to other things than Star Wars. There's a, there are a few references to Star Wars, but I mean I've referenced Better Off Dead that movie. I mean I've referenced all kinds of stuff, uh, whatever sticks in my head. I think she's probably just talking about because I use the phrase "young Jedi" a lot, and that's that's just the one section I think. Another question that came over was: uh, Is there is there a task force in, in real life that is close to what you want? No, no. And I've answered this question before. I, I when I set out to write the book, I specifically wanted to make sure that nobody thought I was writing about real units I'd served in, changed the names to to protect the innocent. So I created something out of whole cloth that we absolutely don't have at all. But I knew that anybody who read it would go, well, you would actually say to yourself, that'd be kind of cool if we had that, but we don't. And so uh, it, it's, it's uh, completely fictional, absolutely. And, and the reason is there's a lot of things that go on in the world. Um, people break the law all the time. I mentioned Duran Contra earlier. Uh, actual covert action is codified in Title 10 or Title 50 of the United States Code because of Iran-Contra. Before that happened, we didn't even have it codified in, in code. Um, every time somebody does something wrong in the intelligence community or in the military, uh, they make a law about it. And it just gets harder and harder. It, it, people ask, you know, if I really wrote a book about what real world operations would be like, it would be 300 pages of PowerPoints and then being told, you can't go. I mean, outside of a war zone, it's really, really hard to get things done. Because you've got to get Department of Defense on board, you've got to get a DEP order signed by the Secretary of Defense, You've got to get State Department on board because you're going into his domain. The ambassador is the, the president's personal representative. If he doesn't want you to do the mission, you're not doing it. Uh, and you've got to get CIA on board because it's all their part of their domain. That's their rice bowl. It's just really hard, really hard to get things through the system. So I created a task force because that would be really unique. <laughs> you could just do it. Go. They could just do it. But you're not alone. I mean, we have Sigma Force and Jim yeah. Rollins' books and what Clancy is, the campus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dirk Pitt, it's NUMA. You know, I'm trying to remember, um, what's the what's the Vince Flynn? Orion team. Yeah, well, I would say Nick Rapp himself. Just, right. Yeah. But I think, you know, you, you, you couldn't really write one of these books if you were strictly within the government oh, yeah. guidelines. You yeah. know, it just wouldn't work. So basically what we have is these all these interesting secret black ops, secret ops, yeah. whatever, or not black, but maybe gray ops, all yeah. over it, right? Yeah. Everybody has their own personality and yeah. does them, and they're a lot of fun to read. You know, I, I have a theory that the Marvel superheroes are doing so well at the moment because we all wish there were some. I mean, with the mess that we're in all over <laughs> the world, you know, it'd be really comforting to think that we could whistle up, you know, a superhero or two. So, do you think some of these task forces are, in point of fact, something like that? The uh, well, I mean, I know that for my own personal task force uh, project, Prometheus, we, there's nothing like that at all. Absolutely not. No, but what one might wish there were. Is my point. Oh yeah, we used to wish there were. Trust me, we, used to think, <laughs> we thought that'd be the greatest thing ever. But, Got uh, it. All right. Anybody have a last question before we wind up? Oh, uh, Dominic, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're okay. Like a question of like, you put in notes of why you kept Amina in Daughter of War. I'm just wondering why you killed off Kurt. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it's, you Don't know. Don't laugh the, when you say that. What's that? No, I'm just Spoiler like, alert. Mm -hmm. Well, that's three or four books ago. I mean. No, yeah, I just mean two, when you say two. you killed him and laughed, it sort of oh, puts those cardinal notes there. No, because <laughs> again, my own feeling, he's the author, he knows what he's, I'm just Yeah, it's just, uh, the, you know, uh, combat's unforgiving, and sometimes things go right, sometimes they don't. Right. Okay. And, um, I mean, I killed off Decoy, too. I really wish I hadn't have done that, but that was early on as well. Yeah. I get a lot of hate mail over that one. Um, but, no, I mean, I just, sometimes bad things happen, and uh, I decide for bad things to happen to him. Somebody occasionally has to be a sacrificial lamb. Not everybody can be Teflon in every book, right? Yeah. No, it's sadly true. Right. On the other hand, you're not allowed to kill animals at all. So if you have a handy dog or whatever That's it is, absolute truth. Go, I killed you know? a dog. It was an attack dog, security dog. And um, Pike's trying to get inside this house, and they let the dog go. The dog runs over to him. Pike stabs it, and uh, I get no way is he killing the dog. And I said, he has to kill a dog. That's part of the thing here. And um, so I said, okay, I won't have him kill a dog on the page, but I'll have him, you know, dispose of the body or something like that. It just won't be him killing the dog. And I got hate mail. 
I'm never reading your books again. I cannot believe you killed a dog. <laughs> you should have just stunned the dog or put a soporific in the meat or something of the sort and knocked him out. Yeah, I'm serious. It's kind of a rule. If I see a movie or something, I'm like, kill the guy, leave the dog alone. He's yeah. doing what he's doing. You know, yeah. he's, you know what I mean? It's just, it's, 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 it's off. Very true. Anybody else? No? Well, in that case, we know we have a book coming next year. We know it's set in mm -hmm. Croatia. Yes. Yay. Serbian bad guys. Serbian bad guys. Okay, Croatian so book 17. Serbian. Right. <laughs> Tumbling on. Well, thank you all very much for your attention. It was wonderful to talk to Brad. So what we're going to do, because he would like you, the guidelines I got was you were going to put your mask on and you wanted them to be masked. Is that correct? Or do you Yeah, that's, I'm just not going to shake anybody's hand.